And first up, we have Michael Holmberg, who's going to present the history of the future of Ethernet, the 50th anniversary. Michael is a distinguished engineer at Extreme Networks and also a member of the NANOG program committee. This is his third time presenting at NANOG. His first talk was called Transport Network Requirements and Architecture for 5G at NANOG 76 in Washington, D.C. in 2019. Michael, the stage is all yours. Thank you, Fergus. Lock them down for you. All right, so good afternoon. I guess I have the pleasure of having the last session here before the lightning talks. So, have you realized that each and everyone in the audience is actually using a 50 years old technology for all the online stuff you're doing? And that technology is Ethernet. So, Ethernet technology has become the backbone of modern communication and connectivity, connecting billions of devices to each other on the internet. I will spend the next 30 minutes or so to briefly explore the history of the groundbreaking technology from its humble beginnings in 1973, with this sketch that you can see on the slide that was supposedly drawn on a napkin, showing the initial thoughts on what the internet would be all about, to its current state of art state with speeds of 400 gig and beyond 800 gig and even terabits already in works. In addition to the speeds, obviously things like TSN, which stands for time-sensitive networking, and other truly mission-critical applications and use cases using Ethernet today will be briefly discussed. So the big day was on May 23rd, 2023, when Ethernet celebrated its 50th anniversary. So where it all started, Ethernet was developed at Xerox Park between 73 and 74. It was inspired by AlohaNet, which Robert Metcalf had studied part, as part of his PhD dissertation. The idea was first documented in a memo that Metcalf wrote on May 22, 1973, where he named it after the luminiferous ether once postulated to exist as an omnipresent, completely passive medium for the propagation of electromagnetic waves. In 1975, Xerox filed a patent application listing Metcalf, David Boggs, Chuck Tucker, and Butler Lampson as inventors. In 1976, after the system was deployed at Park, Metcalf and Boggs published a seminal paper. Four gentlemen named Yogan Dalal, Ron Crane, Bob Garner and Roy August facilitated the upgrade from the original 2.94 megabits per second to the 10 megabits per second protocol, which was released to the market in 1980. In 1978, Xerox implemented 10 megabits Ethernet on coaxial cable, a de development known as the X-Wire. Here, the world's first Ethernet cable sits, assumably, in a room full of printers and copiers at the Xerox Park subsidiary in Palo Alto, as you can see in the picture in the slide. Ethernet initially competed with Token Ring and other proprietary protocols, but Ethernet was able to adapt to the market needs, utilizing inexpensive thin coaxial cable, and then from the 1990 to the nowadays used twisted pair cables. So Ethernet inventor Bob Metcalf founded Tricom in 1979, to commercialize Ethernet products, which helped establish the technology as a dominant standard, and Tricom became a major company where Tricom shipped its first 10 meg Ethernet NIC in March 1981. So it all started from having a shared coaxial cable that traversed a building or campus to every attached machine. It was based on a scheme known as the CSMA CD which stands for carrier sense multiple access with collision detection. This CSMA slash CD governed the way the computer shared a channel. And it was by nature simpler than the competing token ring or token bus technology at that time. In this scheme, the computers are connected to an attachment unit interface or AUI transceiver, which is, the, which is in turn connected to the cable. While a simple passive wire is highly reliable for small networks, 
it is not reliable for large extended networks, where damage to the wire in a single place or a single bad connector could make the whole Ethernet segment unusable. Through the first half of the 1980s, Ethernet's 10 base 5 implementation used a coaxial cable 0.375 inches or 9.5 millimeters in diameter. And this was also referred to as the thick Ethernet or thicknet. And it was standardized back in 1982 as 10 base 5. Some of us who have been around in this industry for many years might recall that on the 10 base 5, you drill the transceiver pin into the core of the thick coax cable. And if you were not careful, you might end up in shortcutting the ether or the wire. So then in the late 1980s, 10 base 5 was replaced by 10 base 2, or thin ethernet, which was referred to as a thin net and it used a BNC connector, connecting the ethernet NIC cards to the BNC T splitter, ensuring that the ethernet segment stayed intact. It used the RJ58 coaxial cable, which is 0.2 inches or 5 millimeters in diameter as media. The emphasis was on making installation of the cable easier and less costly. Then finally, Ethernet over unshielded twisted pair cable, cabling uh, the same as was used on, on, on telephone networks in office buildings, got a boost with the funding of Synoptics company in 1985. The company's LatticeNet hub, which debuted in 1987, offered a product line to run Ethernet over the existing copper cabling plant in buildings, replacing coaxial cable as the technology medium. So to compare the coaxial cable deployment with twisted pair cables, the original Ethernet implement implementation was based on shared medium collision pro. All computers trying to communicate share the same cable and so compete with each other. While modern Ethernet implementation have switched connections collision free, each computer communicates only with its own switch without competing for the cable with others. So the use of twisted pair networks competed with 10 base 2 use of single coaxial cable. In 1988, Ethernet over twisted pair was introduced, running at the same speed of 10 meg. In 1995, fast Ethernet standards upgraded the speed to 100 megabits per second, and no such speed improvements was ever made for thin net. By 2001, prices for fast Ethernet cards had fallen to under 50 uh, bucks. By 2003, Wi-Fi networking equipment was widely available and affordable. So due to the immense demand for high-speed networking, the low cost of CAT5 cable, and the popularity of 802.11 wireless networks, both 10 base 2 and 10 base 5 have become obsolete, though devices using such might still exist in some locations. In the late 1990s, a lot of internet switching companies were founded, like Kalpana and Terasys, Foundry and Extreme Networks, who was actually the first vendor to introduce late 3 gigabit Ethernet switching. Since early 2000s, Category 5 or Cat5 twisted pair cable for computer networks become the standard cable to be used in such networks, providing performance of up to 100 megabits per second and making it suitable for most upcoming variants of Ethernet, such as 10 base T, 100 base TX and 1000 base T. The increased demand for high-speed networking along, along with the low cost of CAT5 cabling led to the rise in popularity of Wi-Fi networks. Additionally, the introduction of the Power over Ethernet or PoE standard in 2003 made it possible to deploy remote networking devices like Wi-Fi access points and IP cameras in areas where power outlets were scarce as network devices could receive power and data over the same Ethernet cable. So, looking at some of the Ethernet's highlights in retrospect, I kind of alluded already to the, that in, in 1980s, several individuals contributed to the transition from the 2.94 meg to the upgraded 10 meg protocol, which became available in the market that same year. In 1980, 
Intel was one of the originators of the XWire Ethernet standard, along with Xerox and Digital Equipment Corp. The DIX specification, were named, where the name came from Digital, Intel, and Xerox, varied slightly from the IEEE 802.3 definition of Ethernet, which was formally approved in 1983. Ethernet was commercially introduced in 1980 and first standardized in 1983 as IEEE 802.3. In early 1990s, fast Ethernet 100 meg product began to appear. The IEEE 802.3U standard for 100 base T was ratified in 95. In 94, the IEEE finalized the 10 base F standard for Ethernet over fiber cable. The standard was firmed up in 1998 and the 1000 base T standard for copper was finalized in 99. So getting then into the millennium and beyond. In 2001, the Metro Ethernet Forum, an organization devoted to defining and promoting Ethernet carrier network services was established. And it's probably quite well known for you in the audience as MEF. In 2006, 10G based T, which outlined running 10 gigabit Ethernet over twisted pair co copper cabling was standardized. In 2008, efforts to ruggedize Ethernet for data centers emerge, with the IEEE working on data center breaching or DCB and shortest path first losses forwarding techniques. At the same time, IETF defined TRIL, which stands for transparent interconnect of lots of links for multiple active paths. And this can be, seen, can be seen as the first iteration of data center fabrics, with a few vendors at that time releasing products, or products based on that technology. In 2010, a study group within IEEE was formed to investigate a leap in Ethernet speed to 100 gig. However, disagreement about speeds complicated the standard development process as server vendors argued that they wouldn't need 100 gig adapters for years. Hence, as a result, they requested a 40 gig Ethernet standard. Consequently, a joint 40 slash 100 gig 802.3BA Ethernet standard was ratified in 2010. In 2013, with the release of the IEEE 802.11AC or Wi-Fi 5, Wireless access points reach speeds of 2 gig or 4 gig, exceeding the 1 gig IEEE 802.3AB 1000 base T wired Ethernet uplink speeds. Although 10G base T had been standardized in 2006, it had limitations regarding the support, supported distances for Cat5 e cabling. As a result, there was a demand for intermediate standards that could uplink the 2 gig and 4 gig speed from Wi-Fi access point over existing cabling infrastructure. The development of the 2.5G based T and 5G based T standards allowed Wi-Fi access points to reach the maximum speeds without being con constrained by the Ethernet uplink speeds over a single existing Cat5e cable. This while also remaining compatible with the newer Cat6 and Cat6a cabling. In 2013, the IEEE began a study group of 400 gig due to the rising bandwidth demand from mobile devices and social networking. Therabit Ethernet refers to Ethernet speeds beyond 100 gig Ethernet. The 400 gigabit Ethernet and 200 gigabit Ethernet standards were developed by IEEE 802.3 PS task force, utilizing technology broadly similar to that of 100, gig ethernet, 100 gigabit ethernet. The standards were approved in 2018. In 2014, a group of companies, including the hyperscalers, formed the 25 gigabit ethernet consortium to develop a more cost-effective standard for data center networks. The IEEE subsequently started working on 25 gigabit ethernet standards part of the IEEE 802.3BY project. Then in 2019, communication service providers began deploying, or more likely, testing 5G networks, which is the fifth generation technology standard 
for broadband cellular networks. It is defined by 3DPP, and 5G is the planet successor for 4G networks. So like its predecessors, 5G networks are cellular networks. All 5G wireless devices in a cell connect to the internet and telephone network via radio waves through a local antenna in the cell. These new networks boost higher download speeds, eventually up to 10 gigabits per second. In addition to being faster than existing networks, 5G offers higher bandwidth, enabling it to connect a greater number of devices and improve the quality of internet services in crowded areas. Naturally, Ethernet acts as the packet-based solution within 5G, accommodating all the essential containerized microservices required for 5G functionality running on computes in various size of data centers. So Ethernet-based cloud data center fabrics come in various sizes, from small edge data center fabrics implemented as layer two infrastructure or truly scalable three-stage or five-stage large data center fabrics. These larger fabrics deployed as layer three infrastructure with dozens or even hundreds of Ethernet switches connected in a spine and leaf architecture, also known as CLAW. The CLAW architecture has its origins in just CLAW, crossbar switches for telephone call switching, and it is com composed of leaf and spine layers where switches are used. The most prevalent design for these cloud data center fabric consists of Ethernet switches using VXLAN with MPBGP and EVPN control play. All Ethernet switches are deployed in pairs to provide dual home redundant connectivity to computes and to the other switches. The leaf switch pairs interconnect to form a cluster, providing redundancy for all the attached computes. All the leaf switches are also deployed in pairs, ensuring dual home redundant connectivity to the external provider edge or PE, routers and the internet. This presents yet another interesting use case in which Ethernet serves as the foundation for cloud-native 5G mobile networks, applications, and workloads. So are we in sync? In today's modern world, Ethernet has evolved to incorporate various applications and technologies. One notable example is time-sensitive networking, or TSN, which enhances Ethernet to become a deterministic networking technology. TSN enables the synchronization of network elements and endpoints, such as switches and routers, to prioritize traffic classes and provide accountable delay and guaranteed bandwidth and reservation. TSN is based on numerous international standards, which are integrated with the Ethernet standard IEEE 802.3. Web punctuality is ensured, allowing for transmission within a given period while simultaneous accommoda simultaneously accommodating a mix of other communication protocols. So as applications continue to advance, and latency has become a significant concern that needs to be addressed, the solution to this problem lies in utilizing PTP or precision time protocol. As we are dealing with timing accuracy in the range of hundreds of nanoseconds. As an, as an excellent example of such systems can be seen in the telecom industry's 5G networks, as I have been alluding to previously in this presentation. Coordinating time between multiple servers could be compared to synchronized swimming in the Olympics, where all swimmers must perform their part of the routine at the same pace. If they perform at different paces, the routine will not look as it should. Therefore, ensuring that all servers operate in sync is vital for efficient network performance. Much like how synchronized swimming relies on all swimmers to perform their part of the routine at the same pace. Discussing TSN further, Ethernet's usage in mission critical networks and telecom industry showcase that Ethernet has now emerged as the de facto transport technology, utilizing protocols like PTP to synchronize clocks throughout the network. To appreciate the significance of PTP, it's important to understand that we're dealing with timing accuracy in the range of hundreds of nanoseconds. This represents extremely tight timing requirements for certain applications and use cases. 
Maintaining precise timing is critical for operating distributed systems at scale, ensuring various operations remain synchronous. Additionally, precise timing is especially critical when handling critical processes that govern infrastructure operations. So, after this short journey covering some highlights in Ethernet's 50 years of existence, one might contend that Ethernet is one of the most critical technologies today. Even though, even, thought, uh, even though it often goes unnoticed, Ethernet as the ubiquitous network technology powers infrastructure all across the cosmos. Yes, I did say cosmos, as it is used in space as well as in the deepest ocean trenches. And as I earlier alluded to, as just one example, it's included in the new era of cloud-native 5G data centers that provide the infrastructure for 5D, 5G applications and workloads. As we are well aware, there's an increasing number of applications being developed that have substantial requirements, not only around bandwidth, but also latency, etc. This demand requires that the underlying transport technologies can cater for that. Consequently, 400 gig Ethernet is reality today, and 800 gig Ethernet is expected to become commonplace in the near future. Given this trend, it wouldn't be surprising to see one terabyte Ethernet in use by 2030, as our appetite for bandwidth shows no signs of diminishing. So we can expect to see Ethernet, this 50-year-old technology, reinvent itself once more. Thank you. Thank you.